All right, happy, happy day after St. Patrick's Day. I commend the two of you for being here on time. Um, so all we're going to, we're only gonna add a little bit because um, I don't really like to add a whole bunch of material right before finals week, even if we do get a, um, even if we do get a review day. Um, so we'll talk and we'll talk about chapter 17. We'll see how far we get into this lecture. Um, probably not all of chapter 17 will be on the test. I think probably just one, one skill um, in particular. And let me, let me pull up the um, practice exam or the uh, exam study guide and see if there's even anything from chapter 17 on there. Or it's chapter 17 there is, that's Deals Alder. There's nothing from chapter 18 on there. Um, so like I said, at most one skill predominantly, um, we got a little bit further in the material than they did last year, um, mostly because despite it being COVID, we, we knew it was COVID when the quarter started as opposed to with three weeks left in the quarter, finding out we weren't coming back um, like last year. Actually, I think it was, it was right around this time. So I think we lost a week of lecture last year. That's why we didn't get quite so far last year. Um, so what the schedule will look like for this next week, um, I'm still, I don't know exactly when I'm planning on the test opening on Monday. Um, if there's anybody who needs to take the test, the final exam on Monday due to scheduling reasons, let me know when you plan on taking it and I'll make sure the test is available. Um, otherwise, I'll probably give take the morning on Monday and give it a final look over, make sure there's no typos or anything like that. Um, and it'll probably go live sometime in the early afternoon on Monday and then you'll have until Friday to finish taking the test. So Tuesday will be, um, we, we will unofficially meet since it's Tuesday's technically finals week, which means we won't meet um, in our normal time slots, but I will be available and we'll have a review session for anybody who wants to attend on Tuesday morning at our regular lecture time. Um, although I think it's probably safe to say that we could all we could all use an extra half hour of sleep these days. So maybe we'll, we'll have it at, uh, at 8.30 instead of eight on, um, on Tuesday. And again, um, optional attendance, no new material. It'll just be you guys asking me questions about the study guide or the practice test. And then you'll have all week to, just like the midterm, except you'll have even more time. It won't be over the weekend. You'll have all week to take the test, um, carve out two hours for yourself, to sit down with your textbook and notes. Um, again, no posting anything um, to from the test to any sort of outside sources. You can use outside sources like Mastering Chemistry um, to help your understanding. The difference where, I, where we're drawing line when it comes to outside sources is one, you have to cite it if you use it. And two, you can't post the specific questions. And I feel like at this point, I shouldn't have to explain the difference, but there's always um, a little bit of gray area for some people. So I'm making it a hard line, posting questions or asking people for help in person or online on specific questions is where you draw the line on that when it comes to an open book test. All right, and so you will only have two hours and if you need to, to post the questions, you probably will run out of time anyway. It's gonna be that the timing is gonna be very similar to the midterm. Um, and then beyond that, the only other you have, 
the lab final, which you can turn in at any time up to next Friday, um, and the practice test. One last homework assignment um, for the for the lab or for the assignments category. Um, although, you know, it's kind of taken the place of the weekend quiz. So I think just like with the um, some of the homework assignments from earlier this year, um, I'll put it in the quiz category. So it gives you a chance to bump up your quiz scores if you've been um, if you haven't done as well as you would like on some of the quiz questions. Um, the, the practice test, make sure you get it done and in, and you should, as long as you finished it, um, I'm not going to, not being going to be grading the practice test on being correct. So as long as you finish it, you'll have a chance to get a, a 10 out of 10 in, um, on that assignment. So that should help any quiz, quiz category grades that you're worried about. Um, the one thing that is not on the practice test is I took off the wild card question because those are really hard to write. So I'm going to reuse pieces of the one from last year. So I'm not giving that to you now. It's going to be something, maybe a little bit of synthesis, maybe a little bit of um, instrumental analysis. Maybe, you know, it might be a, um, bring in some a simple NMR or IR or something like that, or um, something something else related. It's going to be something that that asks you to think outside the box, like you're like you've seen from me in the past. Um, again, I'll I'll ask answer any questions, and we can go over the practice test on Tuesday of next week or in office hours if you have any specific questions. Is, has anybody looked at it? Does anybody have any questions about it yet? All right, sounds good. Let's go ahead and start making our way through the um, through the lecture. So the the big I knew I was forgetting something. I forgot about your quizzes yesterday. I sat down to grade one of the labs, and I knew that there was something I wanted to grade first was the quizzes. Um, all right. So the the key skill early in this chapter is that we need to be able to decide what systems are aromatic and what systems are not. All right, so this is kind of where we left off the other day, which is now a whole week ago, um, was how do we use Huckel's rule to determine what is aromatic and what is not. And so the Huckel's rule, it's really two, two rules, but it's if in order for a system to be aromatic, um, you must have a conjugated pi system that must be cyclic. So conjugated pi system means all the way around the ring. If there's any points where you've got in the ring structure where you've got an sp3 carbon, it's not aromatic by definition. It has to be conjugated all the way around the ring system. And you have to have an odd number of electron pairs. So the way it's in Huckel's rule, the way it's written is you, you must have 4n plus 2 pi electrons. So if, if, n is, um, if n is 1, that gives you 6 pi electrons or 3 pi bonds. If n is 0, it's just 2 pi electrons. So one pi bond. If n is two, it's it's ten pi or ten pi electrons, five pi bonds, right? So it's going to go. If you you need to have an odd number of pi bonds is the way that I I remember Huckel's rule. Um, but this is the official formulation of it. Is it does it by counting pi electrons, not pi bonds, um, which is probably a better way of looking at it because it's not really just pi bonds, right? We saw with resonance structures, you can have lone pairs be delocalized, right? That was one of the skills from the midterm was, okay, which of these lone pairs are delocalized? Delocalized electrons can be part of these pi systems, part of these resonance systems. So delocalized electrons can count as two pi electrons for this, these systems. 
You want to say hi, Valence? Yeah. Hi. All right. Let me finish teaching, okay? Her brother's not awake yet, so she's just wandering around the upstairs by herself, deciding what to do today. All right, so let's practice with these systems. First thing we need to check is, is it fully conjugated all the way around the, the ring? And it has to be a ring. You can't, you can have conjugated pi systems where you've got a pi bond hanging off of a ring. That's not part of determining whether it's aromatic or not. That, that pi bond that's hanging off of it, for instance, if we had a little, a, um, it's the wrong. If we had an alkene hanging off of one of these ring structures, that would still be conjugated with the other pi bonds, but it's not part of the ring structure. So we wouldn't count it as far as determining whether this was aromatic or not. Right, so we're specifically looking just at the ring structure. First off, do any of these have any sp3 carbons in the chain that would that would throw off the conjugation? For all of these, you've got alternating double bonds all the way around. So that means every carbon has a pi bond the way it's drawn, which means every carbon is sp2 and therefore is part of the conjugated pi system. So they all meet criteria one. For criteria two, we just count pi bonds. One, two, three four, five, six. Six pi bonds is not 4n plus two pi electrons. We need an odd number of, of electron pairs. So this would be, would not be aromatic. Would you say why it's not again? I missed that, I'm sorry because it has an even number of electron pairs. So it doesn't meet the 4n plus two criteria. 4n plus two pi electrons means that you're gonna be looking at an odd number of electron pairs. All right, so once, we're, once we establish we meet criteria one, which is the that's the easier one to wrap your head around, right? Criteria one, is it a ring? And is it conjugated all the way around? You can see that pretty, pretty quickly, which is why it's priority one or um, criteria one. Criterion, I think is the singular of criteria, which just sounds weird to say. Um, criterion one, is easier one to check, but B meets that. So two is we count pi bonds. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Seven pi pi electrons or seven pairs of pi electrons means we meet the second criteria. So this one is aromatic. Last but not least, again, first rule is already met. It's cyclic, even if it's a big cycle, it's cyclic and it's conjugated all the way around there. There's no sp3 carbons in the way. So then it's counting one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Even number of pi electrons means we don't meet the second criterion. So it's not aromatic. All right, so odd number of electron pairs.
All right, which means they, we're gonna go into why that is, and that's gonna be the, the last topic we'll cover and we'll start next quarter by going over it one, by reviewing this a little bit, because we're next quarter, we're gonna do a lot with resonance and uh, aromaticity. So we need, we'll brush up on this next quarter. Good job, go ahead and put it over there. So let's go ahead. Um, I thought I, sorry, I thought I broke, broke this up a little bit. Um, I wanna talk about the top half of this first. Hang on, let me get rid of this bottom part. We're not dealing with anti-aromatic uh, anti yet. We'll do that in a second. This is what I want to talk about first. All right, so if we meet some of the criteria, but not all, then it's just not aromatic. It is only aromatic if it meets both of those criteria. Right, so you can have conjugated pi systems, but if they're not a ring, you can't, not even they're conjugated pi systems that even have an odd number of electron pairs. So it satisfies criterion two, but it's not a ring. Therefore, it's non-aromatic. If you have an sp3 carbon in, in the chain, that breaks up that conjugation. You can't have a resonance structure that moves a pi bond towards an sp3 carbon, right? Because it's already got a full valence. So that if it's non-continuous pi system, then it's non-aromatic. And then last but not least, if it's not planar, then those those pi bonds are non-overlapping. So if it's if those pi bonds are not overlapping, they can't resonate, and therefore it's going to be non-aromatic. Hang on one second. All right, I have to figure out how to turn down the volume on the TV real quick. So I will let you consider this next point while I do so. All right, so this is the one that's a little bit trickier to wrap your head around, um, is compounds can be anti-aromatic if they're almost aromatic, but they have an even number of electron pairs. They actually wind up being anti-aromatic, which means they're, they're less stable than if they were non-aromatic, right? And so the way that this works, and this is, we can explain this using what are called frost circles. Um, these frost circles down below are basically however many electron pairs you have, you have that many orbitals that you could arrange um, in terms of energy. And they're always gonna arrange themselves so that some of the orbitals are the same amount of energy. And they're gonna, they follow geometric patterns. So this is not, Frost circles are not for you know, summoning demons, despite what it might look like here, that we're not drawing a pentagram. The whole point with these is it allows us to say how many um, electron pairs are going to be bonding orbitals how and how many are going to be anti-bonding orbitals. And so we, what we look at is the number of, of um, pi, or the number of 
carbons we have in the ring structure and we set them up like a regular polygon. So if you have a four-sided ring, you set it up as a square. We're always gonna put one point of the polygon has to be at the bottom because there's gonna be one way to arrange these orbitals that's gonna be more stable than everything else. So you take all of your, so a four-sided ring looks like a square with a point towards the bottom. A five-membered ring looks like a pen, pentagon with a point towards the bottom, hexagon, heptagon, octagon. And then you draw a circle around it. And draw if you draw a line, a diameter line through that circle, one of a couple of two things is gonna happen. Either you're gonna have um, a significant number, you're, you're either gonna have orbitals right on that line or you won't. When we start filling in the electrons here, we start seeing something. So if we look at, How do I get to a zoom on here? Oh, well. Um, if you look at this one in the top left, so if we had four sides to that ring and two pairs of pi electrons, well, two pairs of pi electrons means we're going to have to try and put two, um, two electrons in that middle section. In that middle section, you have electrons that are, you're going to have these orbitals that are the same energy level. So you have to fill them up one at a time. And so they're what's called non-bonding orbitals because they're not lower in energy than having them split apart. And they're not anti-bonding orbitals. And the big thing is that they're not full. Non-bonding non orbitals are not really unstable or more stable. They're just sort of there. But the fact that we don't have electron pairs when we fill this up means it's not a very stable system. This is what's known as an open shell system. An open shell system is where you have these unpaired electrons are inherently unstable. Even though when we're counting up all the electrons, we have an even number of electrons, on paper, it looks like everything has, an, has a pair. It turns out by, uh, by the molecular orbitals, we get this open shell system. And that's what makes it anti-aromatic. And you'll see that if we do the same thing with, with an octagon, which is this example on the right-hand side, if we have an octagon, we have eight sides to this ring, and we have four pairs of electrons, if we have a total of eight pi electrons. We had alternating double bonds there. When we start filling up from the bottom, we're gonna wind up with this open shell system again, which makes it unstable. Now, if you, if you took, if you had a way to take that octagon and add an extra pair of electrons somehow, then we'd be able to make that closed shell system. Or if you had a way to take away a pair of electrons, then we could make that a closed shell system. We could make it aromatic if we could remove one of those pairs of electrons. But that's really hard to do with an eight-sided ring and not have two atoms with incomplete valences, which is un pretty unstable. All right, so this allows us to take Huckel's rule and explain it and apply it to systems that are not just carbons in a ring. So for each of these examples, we can classify it not just as aromatic or non-aromatic, some of them may be anti-aromatic. And again, anti-aromatic means you're gonna have an even number of electron pairs in the ring structure. All right, so for A, it's cyclic. 
Do you have a conjugated pi system all the way around? Yeah, because the lone pair on that oxygen can resonate. That's the delocalized lone pair. But how many pairs of electrons do we have then? Four pairs of electrons. Four pairs of electrons in the pi system means it's not aromatic. It's, it's either non-aromatic or anti-aromatic. And if this, if this molecule was flat, it would be anti-aromatic. So what we'll, actually, what we'll actually see in real life is that when it's a big enough ring structure like this, it can force itself to not be planar to avoid being anti-aromatic. If I go, think um, like this cyclo, cyclo uh, octa tetraene. So if I drew that flat, it would look like it would look like this. The thing is that would make it anti-aromatic and anti-aromatic is less stable than non-aromatic. So it actually bends itself around to be non-aromatic um, on a test, I would accept either anti-aromatic or non-aromatic for this first one. Casey? Yeah, Sean. So does it fill any of the anti-orbitals or no? It won't quite fill the anti-bonding orbitals um, because if we have, so this is a seven-sided ring. Well, let's, let me double check that before I start. So this one actually would, because it's a seven-sided ring, right? So if we, and it has um, eight pi electrons, so four pairs of pi electrons. So if we started filling this up, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So we would wind up with, not only is it open shell, we also started putting electrons into anti-bonding orbitals, which are much less stable as well. So to avoid that, this, this system would basically not let, it would bend in such a way that those oxygen electrons don't get to participate in the resonance. It would basically make it so that they, so it's not flat. So we could avoid putting that extra pair of electrons in there into a pi system. Um, so most accurately, something with, with a ring structure this big, we would call it non-aromatic. Despite the fact if we forced it to be planar, it would be anti-aromatic. B, we have the same system really, right? From, from an electron point of view, B is about pretty much the same as A. We just have a nitrogen giving a donating a lone pair to the resonance instead of an oxygen. Got a high five. My son is not a morning person. My daughter is. It's really interesting to watch them in the mornings. <clears throat> Excuse me. Right. So if A was non aromatic, then B is also going to be non aromatic. Same logic. We have an odd, we have an even number of pi um, pi orbitals pi electrons um and so it would wind up bending itself out of being planar and we can likely bet if we pulled this up on mole view and looked at the 3d it should have a, would wager it's going to be bent out of plane No, it did not. Let's see what happens if we optimize the geometry.
Okay. Well, one of your labs, a, most of your labs from next for next quarter are going to be in doing computational chemistry, since that's my forte from grad school. So I'll sh be able to show you next quarter why this did not find the correct geometry when I hit geometry optimization. Um, but basically, this should be bent with this oxygen popped up above the rest of them so that the p orbitals won't overlap properly. The way it's, it was drawn there, it, we would definitely say it's anti-aromatic. How about for C? Aromatic, non, anti. First off, do we meet the first criteria? Is it cyclic and have a conjugated pi system all the way around? It's definitely a cyclic system. And if we considered the oxygen and the nitrogen lone pair as part of the pi system in A and B, we would consider one of the sulfur lone pairs to be able to participate in resonance. So we, we meet criteria one. It's a conjugated pi system all the way around the cyclic structure. Now the question is how many pairs of electrons are participating? Can the nitrogen's lone pair particip participate? The nitrogen already has a pi bond that's part of the, the conjugated system, right? So the nitrogen lone pair doesn't count. Remember, that's one of our rules is every atom can have only at most one pair of electrons in the resonance. So the sulfur can donate a pair of electrons, but the nitrogen can't give its lone pair. So that means we have three pairs of electrons in this cyclic system which makes it aromatic. And how about D? Looks a lot like benzene, except we added some nitrogens into the ring structure. Does that change the number of electrons that can participate in the resonance? Those nitrogens have lone pairs, but each nitrogen already has a pi bond, which means those lone pairs are localized. They're, they're not part of the pi system. So D is just like benzene, basically. Would that change if we protonated one of those nitrogens? If we stick a nitrogen on one of those lone pairs, does that change the aromaticity? That lone pair wasn't part of the pi system anyway, right? If the lone pair, if the lone pair was part of the pi system, then when we protonate it, we, we force it to be localized. It's not, it can't resonate anymore because it's stuck in between the nitrogen and the hydrogen. But that lone pair was already stuck in between the nitrogen and the hydrogen. So this one's still aromatic. Let's skip F for a second and let's look at G. G looks kind of like C above it, 
we have two pi bonds, and then we have something with lone pairs. So normally that oxygen, I'm gonna switch to, I'm gonna switch to whiteboard here. We'll look at these simpler cases. So for this top one, this is a molecule called um, furan. And the oxygen has two pairs of pi electrons on it, right? Or two pairs of, of um, non-bonded electrons. Well, one of those pairs can participate, right? In, in the resonance, which means we have three pi pairs. In the resonance structure, we have the two pi bonds plus a, a delocalized lone pair. Therefore, it's aromatic. And same for this bottom example. We have one unpaired electron on the nitrogen. Nitrogen is neutral when it has three bonds, right? So this molecule has one lone pair on it. So that, that lone pair can still be part of a resonance structure, right? So that one's also aromatic. So what happens when we protonate these? Well, if we took this molecule, if we took the furan and protonated it, what would happen to the, um, to the number of pi electrons? So if instead of having that lone pair, we had that lone pair has to be localized now, right? But the oxygen still has another lone pair that's identical to the first one. Now, from an electron standpoint, these two are identical. And if the one with nitrogen was aromatic, the one with the oxygen should still be aromatic, even when it's protonated. Because that lone pair we only protonated one of the lone pairs on the oxygen. The other one is still free to be a part, take part in the resonance structures. What happens if we protonate The nitrogen one. Now all of a sudden we took away the, the ability of, of any lone pairs to resonate, right? So now it's not three pi pairs. It's only two pi pairs. which makes it anti-aromatic. Plus you can think about it now, now we've got an sp3 nitrogen that's in the ring structure that has a full valence that you can't have it participate in any resonance. Right, so if you protonate a nitrogen, that can disrupt the, ar the aromaticity. Protonating an oxygen, unless you protonate both of the lone pairs, is not going to affect the aromaticity because the oxygen has two lone pairs to start with. 
And if you only protonate one of them, the other one is still free to, to do its lone pair thing. So if we go back to our examples here, G we pro is in the same example we talked about. We protonated one of the oxygen's lone pairs, but not both. So it's still aromatic. But for F, now all of a sudden by protonating, we have both of the lone pairs on the nitrogen, or nitrogen when it's neutral only has one lone pair. That, and when we protonated it, we forced it to stay put in one place, which means this now becomes, it's not anti-aromatic, it would just be non-aromatic. Because we don't have a fully conjugated system all the way around the ring structure. Last but not least, H. Aromatic, non or anti. I don't know what I can do. Be able to zoom in on these things. All right, take it back. That still doesn't work. Um, all right, so what are your thoughts for H? Maybe non aromatic because you got sp3 carbons. The sp3 carbons, but they're not part of the resonance structure, are they? They're not part of the ring. So the ring has two sp2 carbons and two nitrogens. The nitrogens don't have any pi bonds to them, but they do have lone pairs. And that gives us a total of three pairs of pi electrons. It does not look like this molecule should be super stable, right? A cyclo butyl group. Um, it looks like it should have a fair bit of strain energy and it likely will, but it's gonna be stable enough. We probably actually isolate this compound because it is aromatic. Cyclic structure, everything in the structure has either a pi bond or a lone pair. And when you count up all of the pi bonds and lone pairs that can participate, we get an odd number of electron pairs. All right, we're gonna go through more practice with this. Like I said, this is, this is the last major skill for this quarter. So, I know this is a tricky one to get the hang of, um, but we'll keep practicing, okay? So let's come back in, in, we don't have that much left today. Let's come back in 15 minutes. Let's come back in nine and we'll keep working on this.
All right, as uh, everybody's coming back here, we found some more good practice problems. Um, I would remind you that a positive charge can, it's going to leave an sp2 atom, but not contribute any extra electrons. So when you're counting these up, consider that. I'll give you guys a head start. And we'll start working through these in a minute or two. All right, so for A, this would also be pretty similar to if we were looking at a benzene ring with something else attached to it. Uh, 
let's see if we'd put a nitrogen there instead, we'd have a lone pair on the nitrogen that could participate in the resonance, right? Which would give us a total of five pairs. Here it's a negative charge on a carbon, but that still counts as a lone pair. So A is going to be aromatic. Cyclic structure, even if it's two cycles fused together, it's still overall cyclic. And every atom in the cycle has either a pi bond or a lone pair. And that gives us an odd number of pairs when we count everything up, so aromatic. B is very similar to the other five-sided rings that we looked at before. If you've got something that has a lone pair as the fifth piece of your ring, we have alternating double bonds all the way around. Well, double bonds or lone pair all the way around. That gives three pairs. of electrons. So also aromatic. Wait, Sean. Mm -hmm. So the two lone pairs on the sulfur count as one in total? Right, because remember, every atom can have at most one pair of electrons that's part of the resonance structure. So it has two lone pairs, but only one of them's delocalized. Okay, that makes sense. Thank you. No problem. Good clarification. How about C? Looks like it should be aromatic, but that little top ring structure kind of throwing me off. Yeah, and so this, this brings up the fact that you can have an aromatic piece of the molecule. We still, this section down here still meets all of our criteria, right? Cyclic, every part of the cycle is part of a conjugated bond or has a lone pair and gives us an overall odd number of pairs. So this bottom part is aromatic and this top piece is non-aromatic, but we would still refer to this as being an aromatic molecule because it has an aromatic portion. Right, so if you've got sp3 carbons that are part of the, of the primary ring structure, then that could throw things off. Like if we had if we had benzene that was missing a pi bond, well, these two carbons are sp3, which means they can't do any resonance, right? So here's an example where the sp3 carbons break there's no possibility of it being aromatic because without those, um, with those sp3 carbons being there, there is no ring structure that is conjugated all the way around it. The, the example above has, has a ring structure that's fully conjugated, and then it has an extra part that's not conjugated. Do you guys see the difference there? So with that in mind, let's look at D. So 
pi bonds not conjugated all the way around. You've got an sp3 carbon with no lone pair as part of your ring structure. That breaks up the aromaticity because there's no resonance that can happen there. You need the cyclic part of it in order for resonance to happen, for the um, aromaticity to happen. What happens for E? So I fill this one in here. Well, we don't have conjugated pi bonds all the way around. We don't have a lone pair. We're missing a lone pair, really, right? But carbocations are sp2. They have a vacant spot, right? That's what makes them, remember, they're, that's why they're planar when we go through a carbocation intermediate. So that doesn't count as a lone pair, but it does count as being, it can be part of the conjugated pi system because it's an empty spot that the pi electrons can move into. Which means this whole thing is conjugated in a ring structure and has three pi pairs of pi electrons. Makes it aromatic. If we had the exact same molecule, and now I'm gonna to have to try and draw a heptagon freehand. If we had that exact same molecule with a negative charge, that's a lone pair now, that's Everything's still conjugated all the way around, but now all of a sudden we have four pairs of pi electrons. So this one would be non or anti. Right, so keeping track of your charges on these carbocations is gonna make a difference because some of them, the charge is going to make it aromatic and some of them, the charge will make it anti-aromatic. Hey, Sean. Mm -hmm. um, sorry if you already went over this. What's the difference between anti and non? Um, anti-aromatic is very, very specific case of, of circumstances where it, it meets all the criteria for being aromatic, but it has an even number of pairs. Okay. And, then, and that well, means that makes it less stable than if it was just non-aromatic. So it's it really is it's like bizarro, bizarro benzene. It's the opposite of the fact that most aromatics are more stable than they would be otherwise. Anti-aromatics are less stable than they would otherwise be. So wait, uh, non meets all uh, all the criteria, but it has even number of pairs, and then a non is what? Non is just anything that doesn't meet all of the criteria. Okay, thank you. So non-aromatics are also a lot more common than anti-aromatics. So when in doubt, say non-aromatic. If, if it doesn't meet the criteria, but you're not sure whether it's non or anti, say non. That's most likely to be right. All right. I think that makes a good place to stop because if we go any further, we're going to start bringing in more reactions. And I think you guys have enough reactions for right now um, to think about. So we will cover oxidation and reactions of benzenes and aromatics um, at the beginning of OCHEM 3 next quarter. So for now, 
we've covered everything we're going to cover this quarter. You're almost done with OCHEM 2. You can do it one more week. Um, so I'm going to end lecture a little bit early. I have office hours today, or you can hang out if you're working on your, if you have any questions about your synthesis project or the practice test, um, then feel free to hang out and ask questions or come back to office hours from 1030 to 1130. Um, and again, I'm, I'll be available by email tomorrow. Um, and then I have, I have a long drive over the weekend. So I will not be answering emails until Sunday is the plan for me to sit down and write the test. So on Sunday, you could catch me. If you email me over the weekend, don't expect an answer until Sunday afternoon. Um, or just hold on to that question until the review session on Tuesday. Um, you will be in office hours on Monday and Tuesday, correct? Correct. Thank you.